The Titanic sank in the early morning hours of April 15, 1912, resulting in the death of over 1,500 people. Ever since, the tragedy has been the constant subject of fascination in popular culture. The first movie depicting the sinking of the Titanic was released only 29 days following the tragedy, and as recently as 2023, the Titanic made international headlines when a submersible imploded on its descent to the wreck, killing the five people on board. Our modern fascination with the Titanic can be explained in part by its prevalent place in our popular culture. Modern audiences will remember the hit movie by Cameron or Celine Dion belting My Heart Will Go On on the bow. I mean, this video in itself is obsessive. It is my longest video to date. And that's because there's a lot of information available about Titanic. Its tragedy, its victims and the aftermath are very well documented. So in this video, we'll be looking at the following. In part 1, we will explore Titanic's backstory, design and life on board. Her passengers, including some of the wealthiest people in the world, will talk about the tragic night of the sinking, its casualties and the aftermath including the American and British inquiries into its sinking. In part 2, we'll try to understand how Titanic cemented its place in popular culture. We'll start by looking at the important role that cinema played to keep Titanic's story alive. We'll even see how Nazis turned Titanic into a propaganda movie during World War II. Titanic. Eine der wirklich grandiosen Schöpfungen des deutschen Filmes. We'll explore the strange world of Titanic on television, including this episode from Futurama. We'll also talk about other pieces of media like video games featuring the Titanic. In part 3, we'll dig even deeper in our obsession with Titanic with odd topics starting with conspiracy theories surrounding the Titanic. We'll talk about lost and found artifacts of the Titanic, including this lost painting, valued at over $2 million in today's money. We'll explore Titanic museums around the world. We'll also talk about the obsessive world of Titanic replicas, small-scale replicas and big-scale megalomaniac projects. We'll also take a look at some strange Titanic products on the market, like this board game. And finally, in part 4, we'll talk about the discovery of the Titanic wreck, the implosion of a submersible on its descent to the Titanic wreck, as well as the Titanic UNESCO status. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to join our growing community. You can also like this video, it helps more than you can ever imagine. And I want to take this moment to thank our returning sponsor, Next Chance. Modern audiences are not the only ones obsessed with Titanic. The ship fascinated past audiences too. So to answer our question, why are we so obsessed with Titanic, we must go back in time and understand the ship itself, the aftermath of its demise, and how the tragedy cemented its place in popular culture. The RMS Titanic belonged to a very special class of ships, the Olympic class ocean liners. The Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic were operated by the White Star Line based in Liverpool, England. Although these ships pale in comparison to modern-day cruise ships, the Titanic impressed its contemporaries. Rightfully so, because in the early 20th century, these ships were marvels of engineering. The Titanic was designed to be the largest, most luxurious passenger ship of all time. According to Britannica, while it's hard to say whether people thought the ship was absolutely unsinkable under any circumstances, it is clear that people believed that the passenger liner's safety design by Thomas Andrews was state-of-the-art, and some did describe it as unsinkable before it ever set sail. Despite that, two of the three ships designed by Thomas Andrews now rest at the bottom of the ocean. We'll talk more about Thomas Andrew later in this video because a big part of people's obsession with the Titanic has to do with the people on board, many of which were famous and prominent figures of the pre-war era. The Olympic was the first of the three ships to sail the sea in 1911 and the only ship to ultimately stay afloat. For its maiden voyage, the ship was captained by Edward Smith, who a year later tragically captained the maiden and only voyage of the Titanic. As for the Britannic, 
she sank after Titanic, but under different circumstances. The ship was requisitioned as a hospital ship during World War I. In 1916, Britannic became the largest ship lost during the conflict when it struck a naval mine laid by Germany. It sank in only 55 minutes, 30 people lost their lives. Which brings us to the most tragically famous of all three Olympic-class ships, Titanic. Titanic rested for six days in Southampton, England, before the beginning of her maiden voyage. And during that time, the ship was briefly open for viewing by the paying public. If you and I bought tickets to go and visit Titanic, here's what we would have seen. The D-Deck reception room, the grand staircase, the first class dining saloon, the à la carte restaurant, and the Café Parisien, among other places on the ship. Throughout this video, we'll be able to visit Titanic thanks to various sources including footage from a game under development called Titanic Honor and Glory. This type of project goes to show how Titanic remains relevant even a hundred years after it sank in the Atlantic Ocean. I will make sure to credit the original source for all footage used in this video. There is so much content about the Titanic online, it's insane. You can watch real-time sinking simulations, full-length analysis of the most mundane details about Titanic, its passengers, engine, and more. Titanic is probably one of the most well-documented shipwreck in history. Passengers of Titanic would either board on the first, second, or third class, and their experience on board drastically varied accordingly. Their survival rate too, as we'll see later. Here's how much we would have to pay to board the Titanic. A first class passenger would pay the equivalent of 3,000 to 87,000 pounds in today's money and would have exclusive access to the most lavish areas of the boat. On the A deck, first class passengers had access to state rooms, public rooms, a reading room, two first class entrances, a lounge, a smoke room, and a promenade. On the B deck, they would find a reception room, a restaurant, and a smoke room. And on the D deck, first class passengers would enjoy the main reception room as well as a dining saloon. A second class passenger would pay the equivalent of £1,200 in today's money and would have access to reasonably lavish areas. On the C deck, they would find a library. The dining saloon for second class passengers was located on the D deck and their cabins were located between the E and the F decks. Second class passengers also had access to a promenade area located on Titanic's boat deck. A third class passenger would pay the equivalent of 300 to 800 pounds in today's money and would have access to several common areas. At the time, Titanic's third class was significantly more comfortable than what other liners offered. On the sea deck, Third-class passengers had access to a general room and a smoking room. Their promenade was located on the B deck and their dining saloon on the F deck. On board the Titanic, your class would also dictate the extravagance of your cabin. Third-class passengers slept on bunk beds in cabins of six berths and they would share bathrooms. Only two bathtubs were available for all 710 third-class passengers. Second-class passengers would sleep in berths built in the walls, and there would be between two and four berths per room. Like third-class passengers, they would share bathrooms, but second-class passengers would also have a wash basin and a chamber pot in their cabin. In first-class, there were two types of accommodations. Standard first-class cabins contained dressing tables, sofas, wardrobes, wash stands, and many more including wardrobes, electric heaters, and even bed warmers. Most standard first-class passengers would share bathroom facilities, although they were significantly more luxurious and available than in second and third class. The wealthiest individuals on the ship would sleep in a parlor suite. Suites were equipped with wardrobe rooms, private rooms, and sometimes a private promenade. Many suites had private entrances and separate servants' quarters. In my opinion, Titanic continues to fascinate us in part because it reflects our societies, past and modern. 
the wealthiest benefit from luxury and comfort, often through means of generational wealth, whereas least fortunate people would endure less comfortable situations with the dream of starting a new life abroad. According to the National Archives, third-class passengers might have been workers or immigrants who were going from England to America for a new life. They would only have one or two outfits and might wear some of the same clothes during the whole trip. Speaking of clothes, did you know that a lot of unused fabric end up in our landfills every year? Today's sponsor, Next Chance, is trying to solve that issue with their reusable gift wraps made of locally sourced and rescued fabrics. Every year, we consume more resources than Earth can produce. So we have to find alternatives to single-use waste like wrapping paper. That's why Next Chance commercialized a sustainable solution with reusable gift wraps, bows, wine bags, and so much more. You can support this channel by visiting nextchance.ca slash gi to see all their cute options and use code gi to get 15% off your next order, plus free shipping in the US and Canada. More info in the description box. Thank you Next Chance for sponsoring this video and thanks for welcoming Mimi and I when we visited your facilities. Back to Titanic, it's now time to talk about the passengers. Second and third class passengers were not as prominent figures of the pre-war era as some of the first class passengers were. Therefore, we usually know less about these passengers but we know enough to feature some of them here today. Miss Rhoda Mary Rosa Abbott was 39 when she boarded the third class with her two sons, Eugene and Rossmore Edward Abbott. Rossmore Edward was only 16 when he boarded. He was a jeweler. The family was from Rhode Island. In 1911, Miss Abbott and her boys decided to move to England to live with her mother. They made the crossing to England on board the Olympic but Miss Abbott eventually decided to return to the States. Titanic was their return trip to America. Mr. Ulas Jensen was a farmer. Originally from Norway, in 1908, he established a livestock farm in Perkins County, South Dakota. In 1911, he decided to visit his relatives in Norway when times were hard. Titanic was his return trip to America. The fate of these third-class passengers are connected and we'll see why later in this video. Some first-class passengers were predominant figures of their time. So who could afford such extravagant luxuries? Well, some of the wealthiest people in the world were on board the Titanic when it sank. John Jacob Astor IV and his pregnant wife Madeleine boarded the ship on the fatal voyage. John was the wealthiest man on Titanic, with a net worth of roughly $87 million. In today's money, he would be worth around $2.33 billion, that's as rich as Oprah. Also on board was the founder of the Macy's department store chain, Isidore Strauss, and his wife. He too was incredibly wealthy at the time of the tragedy. Other famous passengers were traveling on Titanic's first class including Dorothy Gibson, a 22-year-old singer, model, and movie star. More on her later. Benjamin Guggenheim, the heir of the Guggenheim mining fortune. He was traveling with his alleged mistress, a French singer named Leontine Aubard. Benjamin took the precaution to book two separate cabins for him and his mistress, although the high society gossip machine probably knew about their affair. Molly Brown, the wife of a Colorado mining kingpin. As the tragedy unfolds, we'll see how she became one of the most famous figures on the Titanic, cementing her place in history and popular culture. She was portrayed by none other than Katie Bates in James Cameron's Titanic. J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line, was also on board the Titanic. Other higher-ups from the White Star Line were also on board, including Thomas Andrews. Andrews designed Titanic. His final plans included 16 watertight compartments, featuring doors that could be closed from the bridge to seal off the compartments if necessary. His design allowed for four compartments to flood, and the ship would still stay afloat. 
This safety system partially led White Star Line to describe Titanic as practically unsinkable. Andrews, like many in first class, was born in a prominent family. His brother John went on to become Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. By the way, if you like this video, just like the video, it helps a lot with the algorithm. Thank you. Titanic's maiden voyage did not go as planned. Here's what happened. On the 2nd of April 1912, the Titanic set sail from Belfast, where it was built, to Southampton, where it rested for six days before her maiden voyage. 920 people boarded Titanic in Southampton before it headed to Cherbourg, France, 274 additional passengers boarded. Then Titanic headed to Queenstown in Ireland, where 120 passengers boarded and 7 lucky passengers disembarked. Titanic then set sail on her first and last transatlantic voyage. She was heading to New York but famously never made it. On the 15th of April, 1912, Four days into its voyage, Titanic sank in the Atlantic Ocean. Here's how the day unfolded. The morning prior to the collision, Captain Edward Smith tragically cancelled the scheduled lifeboat drill. Throughout the 14th of April, the crew received iceberg warnings. This prompted the captain to head slightly south, but he never lowered the ship's speed. At 9.40 p.m., a ship radioed the Titanic warning about heavy pack ice and a great number of large icebergs. But the wireless operator never passed the warning to the Titanic's bridge as he was busy handling passengers' messages. At 10.55 p.m., a second ship radioed the Titanic with yet another warning. We are stopped and surrounded by ice. This time, the wireless operator replied, Shut up, shut up, I'm busy. At 11.35 p.m., the crew spotted an iceberg in Titanic's path. They rang the bell three times and called the bridge. Titanic was then stirred to the left and her engines were reversed. The door to the supposedly watertight compartments were also closed. At 11.40 p.m., Titanic scraped along the iceberg. Captain Smith arrived on deck and was shortly informed that the mail room and at least five other compartments were filling with water. After surveying the damage, Titanic's designer Thomas Andrews predicted that the ship had only about one or two hours before sinking. Titanic's fate was sealed. At midnight on the 15th of April 1912, lifeboats began to be readied for launch but there were only 20 boats available with space for 1,178 passengers. There were 2,200 people on board. An order was given to board women and children first, with crew members to row and guide the boats. At 12.15 a.m., Captain Smith tasked the wireless operator to send distress signals with coordinates. Come at once, we have struck a berg. The Frankfurt is among the first boats to respond, but was 315 kilometers away. Titanic's twin ship, the Olympic, also responded, but was even further away. Finally, the Carpathia received a distress signal. It immediately changed course to aid the Titanic located 107 kilometers away. Back on deck, Titanic's passengers were waiting to board lifeboats while Titanic's musicians kept playing music. This image of Titanic's musicians playing on deck as Titanic sank deeper into the Atlantic is featured in every book and film about the tragedy, further feeding into the myth of the Titanic. At 12.45 a.m., the first lifeboat was lowered. Although it had room for 65 people, only 27 were on board. Many of the first lifeboats were launched below capacity. Some passengers were still under the impression that they were safer on board Titanic. At that time, Titanic fired its first distress rocket. Throughout the sinking, eight rockets were launched, but none were successful. At 12.55 a.m., a lifeboat was launched with Molly Brown on board. The boat was commanded by Quartermaster Hytchens, who was at the wheel when the Titanic struck the iceberg. Quartermaster Hytchens 
later refused to look for survivors, which angered Molly Brown, who threatened to throw him overboard. At 1.10 a.m., Isidore and Ida Strauss were offered seats on one of the lifeboats, but Isidore refused to board before women and children. Ida refused to leave her husband's side. At 1.20 a.m., Benjamin Guggenheim's alleged mistress boarded a lifeboat. Guggenheim and his valet are believed to have changed into formal attire and reportedly said, we've dressed up in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. Reality or fiction, it's impossible to tell, but these types of stories feed into Titanic's myth. This scene is depicted in James Cameron's film. At 1.25 a.m., Titanic's sister ship, the Olympic, radioed, Are you steering south to meet us? Seeming to misunderstand the situation. Titanic responded, We are putting women off in boats. The Olympic will later be informed by the Carpathia of the Titanic sinking. At 1.30 a.m., panic grew aboard Titanic when several desperate male passengers attempted to board one of the lifeboats. In response, 5th officer Harold Lowe fired his gun three times. Lowe will later be placed in command of the boat and will help coordinate efforts to rescue survivors in the freezing waters of the Atlantic. The water was really cold that night, we're talking about minus 2 degrees on average, so hypothermia quickly set in. At 1.40 a.m., White Star Chairman J. Bruce Ismay boarded a collapsible lifeboat. He later claimed that no women or children were in the area, but others reject his version of events. His decision to board a lifeboat led to many calling him a coward for the rest of his life. More on that later. At 1.45 a.m., Madeleine Astor, who was five months pregnant, boarded a lifeboat. Her husband, John Jacob Astor, the richest man on board Titanic, asked if he could join, but he was refused access. Astor did not argue and simply stepped away. At 2 a.m., almost all lifeboats were rowing away from the sinking Titanic. At this stage, the bow had sunk so much that the propellers were visibly above water. Captain Smith released the crew and told them it's every man for himself. At 2.18 a.m., the scene was plunged into darkness when Titanic's lights went out. Movies always depict this scene brighter than it actually was so that you and me, the viewers, can actually see what's going on on screen. But in reality, it must have been pitch black. Take a look at this video from a Reddit user. As the bow continued to sink, the stern rose even higher out of the water, putting too much strain on the midsection of the ship. As a result, Titanic broke into two pieces. The bow section began to sink toward the bottom of the sea, while the stern briefly settled back in the water before rising again, eventually becoming vertical. Then it began its final plunge. There are many theories about how Titanic sank, but I believe this one is the most widely accepted. Correct me if I'm wrong. At 2.20 a.m., Titanic was gone and hundreds of passengers were left in the freezing water. Although many lifeboats were not filled to capacity, crewmen feared they would be swamped by survivors if they attempted to help. Eventually, several boats returned to rescue survivors, but it was too late. Most froze to death. In the hours that followed the sinking of the Titanic, many other ships tried to reach the operator. The wireless operator aboard the Burma, wrongfully believed to have heard the Titanic signal, steaming full speed to you, shall arrive to you by 6 in the morning, hope you're safe. At 3.30 a.m., more than three hours after receiving Titanic's distress signal, the Carpathia finally arrived. It took several hours for the crew to pick up survivors. At 4.10 a.m., now aboard Carpathia, White Star Chairman J. Bruce Ismay wrote a message to be sent to the White Star Line's offices. 
I deeply regret to advise you that the Titanic sank this morning after a collision with an iceberg, resulting in serious loss of life. Further particulars later. At 8.50 a.m., the Carpathia headed to New York City with 710 Titanic survivors on board. The ship entered New York to massive crowds on the 18th of April. So what happened to the passengers we met earlier, who survived and who didn't? John Jacob Astor IV, the richest man on board, perished with the ship. His pregnant wife, Madeline Astor, who boarded a lifeboat in front of John, survived and gave birth to their son four months after the tragedy. Isidore Strauss, the founder of Macy's and his wife, also perished with the ship. Dorothy Gibson, the 22-year-old singer, model and movie star, survived the sinking. One month later, she starred as herself in Saved from the Titanic, the first of many movies about the tragedy. Later in this video, we'll discuss this movie in detail as well as every other movie ever made about Titanic because cinema played a big role in fueling our obsession with Titanic. Benjamin Guggenheim, the heir to the Guggenheim mining fortune, died aboard the ship with his valet, both dressed as gentlemen. His alleged mistress survived. Molly Brown, who urged her lifeboat commander to return and rescue passengers, rose to fame after the tragedy. She organized a survivors committee with other first class survivors. The committee helped second and third class survivors meet basic needs. She later ran for the US Senate, but ended her campaign and returned to France amid World War I. Her obituaries referred to her as the unsinkable Molly Brown, sealing her place in history along with the Titanic. J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line, survived. The press on both sides of the Atlantic heavily criticized him for deserting the Titanic while women and children were still on board some going as far as calling him the coward of the Titanic and running cartoons depicting him deserting the ship. Band leader Wallace Hartley and his musicians all died. What about the third class passengers we met earlier? Remember I told you the fate of these passengers were connected. As the Titanic took her final plunge, Miss Abbott and her two sons jumped from the deck. Miss Abbott eventually managed to get into a collapsible boat but her two boys were lost. Ulas found himself near the fourth funnel. He eventually jumped into the water. That's when he got entangled in a line, but managed to break free. He swam for 20 minutes in the icy water before finally reaching the same collapsible boat Miss Abbott was on. He tried to pull himself into the waterlogged boat, but someone inside shouted, don't capsize the boat. He clung to the side for a while before eventually dragging himself aboard. Titanic continues to fascinate us in part because of the scope of the tragedy. According to the British Board of Trade, only 710 passengers survived the sinking of the Titanic for a total of 1,514 casualties. Earlier in this video, we saw how your class influenced your experience on board Titanic. It also had an impact on your odds of surviving the tragedy. Here's a breakdown. Of the 706 third class passengers, 178 survived for a survival rate of 25%. Of the 285 second class passengers, 118 survived for a survival rate of 41%. Of the 325 first class passengers, 202 survived for a survival rate of 62%. These numbers help illustrate the influence that class and money can have on all aspects of our society. Most second and third class passengers died, whereas most first class passengers survived. As the Titanic sank, orders were clear. Women and children must board lifeboats first. Let's see how this order affected casualties. Of the 402 women on board, 296 survived, for a survival rate of 74%. Of the 109 children on board, 56 survived, for a survival rate of 51%. Of the 805 men on board, 
146 survived, for a survival rate of only 18%. So, being a woman in the first class afforded you the highest odds of surviving the tragedy. What about the crew? Of the 908 crew members, 212 survived, for a survival rate of 23%. This is lower than the third class survival rate. There were also animals on board Titanic, we don't talk about that very often. Actually, Titanic had an official cat called Jenny. Cats were historically carried on ships mostly to control rodents. Jenny was transferred from the Olympic, and she gave birth one week before Titanic's maiden voyage. From what I understand, the kittens were on board Titanic with her when it sank. She is said to have lived in the gallery, where the staff fed her and her kittens on scraps from the kitchen. There was also a King Charles Spaniel like my dog Mimi on board. Mimi did not survive. Other pets included two Airedale Terriers, both dead, a Chow Chow, dead, a French Bulldog, dead, a Pomeranian, survived, a dog whose breed is unidentified, survived, a Pekingese, survived, and an unidentified toy dog whose story is actually very sad. Frou Frou was owned by a passenger named Helen Bishop. She was allowed to keep the dog in her cabin because the staff of the Titanic considered it too pretty to house with the other dogs. Helena left Frou Frou to die in her cabin when she realized that there would be little sympathy for a woman carrying a dog in her arms when there were lives of women and children to be saved. There were likely more animals on board Titanic. The story of the Titanic is one of engineering marvels and innovation, class segregation, opulence and poverty. But most importantly, it's the story of man versus nature. A cautionary tale about our own mortality, and a reminder that life is unfair, that even in the cold waters of the Atlantic, your class dictates your survival rate. There were also efforts to rescue deceased bodies on the site of the wreck. These four ships, CS Mackay Bennett, CS Minia, SS Algerine, and CGS Montmagny, recovered over 300 bodies at the site of the wreck. But most bodies were never recovered. According to some sources, a few bodies were buried at sea. A little over 200 bodies were brought to Nova Scotia, where about 100 were buried at the Fairview Lawn Cemetery. About 20 were buried at this Catholic cemetery, and about 10 were buried at this Jewish cemetery. Some bodies were claimed by families and buried elsewhere. About 40 bodies remain unidentified to this day and rest in Halifax. But the story of the Titanic has just begun. The aftermath of the tragedy is as fascinating as its maiden voyage. Enters politics. The aftermath of the tragedy plays as big of a role in cementing the tragedy in popular culture as the sinking itself. That's because the tragedy led to important changes. The press, survivors, and the public pressured elected officials for answers. What happened on the night of the sinking? Why were lifeboats launched below capacity? Why did Titanic take a risk knowing the dangers associated with iceberg fields? And perhaps the question on everyone's lips, why did J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line, dubbed as the coward of the Titanic, deserted the ship when so many were still on board? Elected officials on both sides of the Atlantic responded with public inquiries. These inquiries also helped keep the media's focus on the tragedy, contributing to past and current fascination with the Titanic. In the United States, a subcommittee of the Senate was quickly tasked to lead an inquiry into the sinking of the Titanic with Senator William Alden Smith as chairman. They supponed survivors and prominent figures related to the Titanic, including J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line, who was their first witness. Other witness included the most senior survivor officer, Charles Lighthaller, second officer on Titanic the lookout who sounded the alarm, Frederick Fleet, and the surviving wireless operator, Harold Bride. 
Crew members of the Carpathia also testified. Arthur Rostin, the captain of the Carpathia, Harold Cottam, the wireless operator on Carpathia. Expert witnesses spoke on subjects such as radio communications, iceberg formation and newspaper reportings. Others called to give testimony including Philip A. S. Franklin, Vice President of International Mercantile Marine Co., the shipping consortium headed by J.P. Morgan that controlled the White Star Line. The inquiry concluded with Smith visiting Titanic's sister ship Olympic in port in New York where he interviewed some members of the crew and inspected the ship's system of watertight doors and bulkheads, which was identical to that of Titanic. Obviously, the Senate inquiry helps fuel the media circus, but here are the key findings of the subcommittee. 1. The Titanic lacked emergency preparation. This led to a chaotic evacuation. The report reads, No general alarm was given, no ship's officers formally assembled, no orderly routine was attempted or an organized system of safety began. 2. Titanic's safety and life-saving equipment were not properly tested. 3. Titanic's captain, Edward Smith, had shown an indifference to danger, described as a contributing factor in this unnecessary tragedy. The report notes that J. Bruce Ismay had not ordered Captain Smith to put on extra speed, but Ismay's presence on board may have contributed to the captain's decision to do so. 4. The lack of lifeboats is the fault of the British Board of Trade, to whose laxity of regulation and hasty inspections the world is largely indebted for this awful tragedy. 5. Third-class passengers were not prevented from reaching lifeboats, but, in many cases, third-class passengers did not realize the boat was sinking until it was too late. Despite their findings, the subcommittee did not find the White Star Line negligent under existing maritime laws. The company had nearly followed standard practice. Chairman Smith made a number of recommendations for new regulations to be imposed on passenger ships wishing to use American ports. 1. Ships should slow down on entering areas known to have drifting ice and should post extra lookouts. 2. Navigational messages should be brought promptly to the bridge and disseminated as required. 3. There should be enough lifeboats for all on board. 4. All ships equipped with wireless sets should maintain communications at all times of day and night. 5. New regulations were needed to govern the use of radio telegraphy. 6. Adequate boat drills were to be carried out for passengers. 7. Rockets should only be fired by ships at sea as distress signals and not for any other purposes. Senator Smith also suggested three pieces of legislation. 1. He proposed a joint resolution with the House of Representatives to award a Congressional Gold Medal to Captain Rustin of the Carpathia. 2. He proposed a bill to re-evaluate existing maritime legislation. Finally, 3. He proposed another joint resolution to establish a commission to inquire into the laws and regulations on the construction and equipment of ships. The report's recommendation on the regulation of wireless telegraphy were eventually passed into law. The Radio Act of 1912 mandated that all radio stations in the US be licensed by the federal government, as well as mandating that seagoing vessels continuously monitor distress frequencies. In addition, the existing Wireless Ship Act of 1910 was amended to add new regulations governing how wireless telegraphy aboard ships should be managed. On the other side of the Atlantic, the English also launched their own public inquiry. This set the English and Americans on a collision course because the English inquiry was overseen by the British Board of Trade the agency that the U.S. Senate report blamed for the insufficient lifeboat requirements. The English, much like the Americans, concluded that the sinking of the Titanic was the result of her dangerously fast speed despite warnings of icebergs. But unlike the Americans, 
The English concluded that the Board of Trade and Titanic's captain, Edward Smith, played no role in the tragedy. Their report says Smith was not negligent because he had followed long-standing practices which had not previously been shown to be unsafe. The British report also made recommendations that led to changes in safety practices akin to the conclusion of the American Senate. These legislative changes add to the historical importance of the Titanic's tragic fate. The sinking of the Titanic, as well as the media and political circus that followed, all happened at the tail end of the pre-war era. As such, the story of its passengers and the opulence of its first class, the naivete of its safety devices, are all reminiscent of a foregone era. A perfect setup for books, radio dramas, television shows, and movies. In fact, cinema played a big role in making Titanic the most famous shipwreck in history. There were numerous movies made about Titanic and they all had their own spin. The first movie ever made about the Titanic was a silent film named Saved from the Titanic. It starred Dorothy Gibson who survived the tragedy and it was released only 29 days after Titanic sank. Unfortunately, this movie is believed to be lost after a studio fire. Two more movies were released in 1912, the year of the tragedy. La Antise was a short French movie. It tells the story of a woman who is told by a palm reader that one of her loved ones will die. Following the reading, she tries to convince her husband not to board the Titanic in Cherbourg. In Nacht und Dice was a German movie also released in 1912. Until 1988, this movie was believed to be lost. It tells the story of a few passengers boarding at Southampton. The fourth movie about Titanic was released much later, in 1929. This movie, like later movies about the Titanic, was a technical masterpiece. Atlantic is the first sound movie about the Titanic, and it was a pioneering sound on film release. The scenario is a fictionalized account of the tragedy. It was produced in three languages, English, German and French, as well as silent versions. It was a huge hit in Germany. The title of the film is Atlantic, which is also the name of the ship in the film. That's because the White Star Line refused to give the filmmakers permission to use the word Titanic in the film. Bad publicity. Four years later, in 1933, Cavalcade was released. It was based on a play of the same name and tells the story of fictional characters during the first third of the 20th century. Two of the main characters die on Titanic. The film won three Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director. In 1943, Titanic was used by Germany as Nazi propaganda. The movie was personally overseen by Joseph Goebbels, chief propagandist for the Nazi party. It tells the story of a fictitious German first officer on the Titanic. He's the hero and British people are villains. This is also the first ever movie to be named Titanic, but not the last. The movie was filmed on board the German liner SS Cap Arcona. This ship was later used as a prison ship. In May 1945, the ship was carrying prisoners from Nazi concentration camps when the Royal Air Force sunk it by mistake, killing about 5,000 with an additional 2,000 casualties in the sinking of the accompanying vessels of the prison fleet. Ten years later, in 1953, another movie titled Titanic was released. Now in the post-World War II era, this American movie depicted an estranged couple sailing on the Titanic until their demise. The film was praised by critics. It was also the first Titanic movie released by 20th Century Fox, which will later release James Cameron's version. 1958 saw the release of A Night to Remember, possibly one of the most famous Titanic movies ever. This movie is based on a book of the same name and is regarded as one of the most historically accurate movies about the tragedy. Although the movie does not depict the ship breaking in half during its sinking, there were still doubts about the splitting at that time. It's only in 1985 
when the wreck of Titanic was found that they could confirm she indeed split. A Night to Remember famously reuses some footage of the 1943 Nazi propaganda movie. Take this scene for example. The engine room flooding miniature sequence shows some scenes were reused in the 1958 version. Most were flipped in the optical printer. The Unsinkable Molly Brown is a musical film released in 1964. It is based on a 1960 musical of the same name. This film also reuses old footage from a previous movie. The scene of the Titanic hitting the iceberg is from A Night to Remember, but was colorized. Debbie Reynolds was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actress for her portrayal as Molly Brown. In 1980, they released Raise the Titanic, which is often viewed as one of the worst movies about Titanic. Based on a book of the same name, the plotline focuses around the plan to raise the Titanic wreck to the surface to recover a cargo valuable to win the Cold War. This movie flopped, unlike the next movie. The 1997 Titanic movie is one of the most successful movies of all time. I trust we all know the plot of this movie. It was also the most expensive movie ever made. Titanic was also accompanied by the hit song My Heart Will Go On, sung by Celine Dion, worldwide legend and Quebec icon. For the little story, Celine Dion never wanted to record that song, but she was eventually convinced to record a demo. The vocal performance you hear on the track is that demo, recorded in one take, and it became her biggest English hit ever. The movie was praised by audiences and critics for its visual effects, performances, directing, production value, score, cinematography. I mean, this is one of the great masterpieces of the seventh art. It also won countless awards. It is difficult to top the success of James Cameron's adaptation of the Titanic tragedy, but some will try. That same year, another Titanic movie was released. If bad timing exists, this is it. The Chambermaid on the Titanic is a French-Spanish-Italian romantic film telling the story of a stevedore who falls in love with one of the Titanic's chambermaids. It is based on a French novel titled La Femme de Chambre du Titanic. 1999 saw the release of The Legend of the Titanic, an animated fantasy tale about the tragedy of the Titanic. The movie attempts to recount the story of the Titanic's maiden voyage in a family-friendly manner. This movie has a sequel released five years later. It's called In Search of the Titanic. In 2000, another animated movie about the Titanic was released. Titanic Legend Goes On tells the story of a poor girl boarding the Titanic in search of love and her missing mother. The last movie we will cover in this video is A Little Left Field. Holmes and Watson is a comedy movie released in 2018. It's the story of two detectives trying to prevent a plot to assassinate Queen Victoria by detonating a bomb on board the Titanic. The Titanic was actually conceived and built a decade after Queen Victoria died, so this movie makes absolutely no sense. It goes to show how cinema capitalized on Titanic, in part because modern and past audiences were always fascinated with the tragedy. Television also depicted the tragedy of the Titanic. There were also TV movies about the Titanic and also special episodes from popular series. Let's take a look at some of those. We can trace this trend back to the mid-50s. Craft Television Theater was an anthology drama series. In 1956, they released an episode about the Titanic called A Night to Remember. It was a TV adaptation of Walter Lord's 1955 book of the same name. A year later, in 1957, Telephone Time, another anthology drama series, told the story of Titanic in a short segment called The Unsinkable Molly Brown. This TV production also used footage from the 1943 Nazi propaganda movie. In 1959, One Step Beyond, an anthology drama series, released an episode called Night of April 14th. It tells the story of premonitions and nightmares preceding the sinking. 
in 1961, Way Out, a horror, fantasy, and science fiction television anthology series, aired an episode titled I Heard You Calling Me. It tells the story of a woman planning to elope with a married man. She's invited on a free ocean cruise by the ghost of the man's mother who died on the Titanic. <laughs> Very strange. The Time Tunnel was a science fiction drama. Their first episode in 1966 was called Rendezvous with Yesterday. The main characters time traveled back to the Titanic one day before the disaster. They try to warn the captain, but he disbelieves them. They get locked up and narrowly avoid going down with the ship. Some footage and sets from the 1953 Titanic movie were reused in this episode. In 1971, the anthology series Night Gallery aired an episode called Lone Survivor. It tells the story of a lone survivor of a Titanic lifeboat who is discovered three years after the event by the Lusitania. Television takes a lot more artistic license when compared to most Titanic movies. In 1973, British drama TV show Upstairs Downstairs opened their third season with an episode titled Miss Forrest. It tells the story of two characters aboard the Titanic. They are presumed dead, but in the next episode, it is revealed that one survived the wreck. In 1979, the TV movie SOS Titanic aired. It tells the story from the perspective of three groups of passengers in first, second, and third class. This was the first Titanic movie released in color. The TV movie reused and colored footage from the 1958 movie A Night to Remember. In 1983, the television drama Voyagers aired an episode called Voyagers of the Titanic. One character wants to prevent the disaster, but the other argues it's destined to happen. They fail to prevent the wreck, but save the Mona Lisa from being lost with the ship. Obviously, this is pure fiction. The Mona Lisa was not on board Titanic, although there were some real art pieces that were lost in Titanic, and we will talk about that later in the video. Also in 1983, the animated series Super Friends aired an episode titled Terror on the Titanic. It tells the story of two divers attacked by monsters while exploring the Titanic wreck. The monsters were ultimately defeated by Aquaman and Black Vulcan. In 1994, Titanic, Nachspiel einer Katastrophe, aired on German television. It tells the story of the US Senate inquiry into the sinking of the Titanic. In 1996, a two-part series called Titanic aired. It is notable because it was the first movie to show the Titanic split in two. The same year, in 1996, another TV movie was released. No Greater Love tells the story of a young woman who takes charge of her young sibling after losing her fiancé and parents in the sinking. In 1999, the animated series Futurama aired an episode called A Flight to Remember. The Planet Express team takes a cruise on the largest starship ever built, the Titanic. The ship is eventually torn in half and sucked into a black hole on its maiden voyage. Perhaps Futurama inspired this next entry. In 2007, Doctor Who aired an episode called Voyage of the Damned. It tells the story of a luxury spaceship called Titanic. Doctor Who tries to prevent a collision with Earth, but in a later episode, Titanic crashes into London, killing millions. Oh boy, the next one is wild. The television movie Titanic 2 aired in 2010. It's the story of a cruise ship setting sail on the 100th anniversary of the Titanic's maiden voyage. A tsunami eventually seals the faith of the passengers. Also in 2010, in the very first episode of Downton Abbey, the main characters learn of the Crawley family heir's death aboard the Titanic. In 2011, the show Supernatural aired an episode called my heart will go on. It tells the story of an angel changing history by avoiding the sinking of the Titanic, but it leads to unforeseen consequences. We have four entries in 2012, probably because it marked 100 years since the tragedy. The docudrama Saving the Titanic aired in 2012. 
It tells the story of the engineers on board Titanic who did everything they could to keep the ship's electricity running during the sinking. Also in 2012, a four-part TV drama titled Titanic aired. The miniseries shows the splitting of the Titanic according to a new breakup theory. The third release in 2012 was Titanic Blood and Steel. It's a 12-part TV drama telling the story of the construction of the ship. This show was criticized for its numerous deviation from historical facts. The final release in 2012 is called Titanic The Aftermath. It focuses on the lives of those who survived the shipwreck. In 2015, Family Guy aired a Titanic-themed episode called Stewie, Chris and Brian's Excellent Adventure. The characters time travel to the Titanic but manage to leave the ship during the sinking. Finally, in 2022, the TV movie Titanic 666 aired. It's a sequel to Titanic 2. It tells the story of a third version of the Titanic sailing on its maiden voyage to the wreck of the Titanic but paranormal forces take over. Obviously, there are many other pieces of multimedia about Titanic. We can't cover everything in this video, but here are some noteworthy examples. Titanic was the subject of multiple documentaries. For example, in 1986, National Geographic released a documentary called Secrets of the Titanic. It documents the finding of the wreck and the expedition that led to its discovery. Titanic also inspired many books, fiction and non-fiction. Perhaps the most famous is A Night to Remember, written by Walter Lord and published in 1955. It inspired many movies and TV series about the Titanic. Speaking of books, I know you've been patiently waiting for our next Ban Book review, so I'm very happy to announce that the next book we will be reading is Mouse. It tells the story of the author's father who survived the Holocaust. It depicts Jews as mice and Germans as cats. This book was recently the subject of controversy when some school boards in America started to ban it. So make sure to subscribe for that and in the meantime, there are more videos about banned books on my channel. There were also radio dramas about the Titanic. For example, the BBC aired a radio drama called Titanic Letters in 1998. It is based on 42 letters written by Titanic passengers and crew. Titanic also inspired a number of theater productions. For instance, in 1997, there was a Broadway production called Titanic and it won five Tony Awards. Titanic is also referenced in multiple songs. For example, U2 references the Titanic on their 2000 album titled All That You Can't Leave Behind. Some lyrics to their song New York read I hit an iceberg in my life, but you know I'm still afloat. You lose your balance, lose your wife, in the queue for the lifeboat. There are also poems about Titanic. For example, Henry Van Dyke wrote a poem titled Heroes of the Titanic. I'll put it on the screen, you can pause if you want to read it. Earlier in this video, we briefly mentioned video games. For example, Titanic is featured in Call of Duty Black Ops 4. The game opens on the Titanic as it hits the iceberg. The scope of creative work inspired by the Titanic really shows how much it had an impact on popular culture. With that fascination comes conspiracy theories. I want to make clear that none of these conspiracy theories are founded or proven, but I want to talk about them because it shows how much Titanic impacted popular culture. The Olympic Swap Theory was elaborated by Titanic conspiracy theorist Robin Gardner. In his book, Titanic, the ship that never sank, he's <laughs> he suggests that Titanic never sank. According to him, her sister ship, the Olympic, was disguised as the Titanic when it sank on the fateful night. Gardiner believes that the White Star Line was committing some sort of insurance fraud. Another popular conspiracy theory suggests that Titanic was sunk on purpose to oppose the creation of the Federal Bank. According to this baseless conspiracy theory, some of the wealthiest passengers like John Jacob Astor and Benjamin Guggenheim were opposed to the creation of the central bank. 
Conspiracy theorists believe that JP Morgan arranged for the ship to sink to eliminate the wealthy men opposed to the Federal Reserve Bank. Even the Senate inquiry was the subject of a conspiracy theory. Some people apparently believe that the inquiry was a Freemason's whitewash. Conspiracy theorists believe Freemason's members allowed establishment figures to escape punishment. This is also baseless. As you may imagine, some valuable pieces of art were traveling with wealthy passengers on Titanic. Most famously, a painting titled La Circassienne au Bain perished with the wreck, painted by French history painter Marie-Joseph Blondel. It depicts a naked woman bathing. Before making it on the Titanic, the painting was exhibited at the Louvre Museum in the early 1800. It gained worldwide notoriety when survivor Moritz Stefansson filed a claim for financial compensation in January 1913. The claim was the largest made against the White Star Line for a single item. The amount of the claim was $100,000, which would be the equivalent of over $2.6 million in today's money. This is the perfect segue to talk about people who are obsessed with artifacts from the Titanic. It's also the perfect time to hit that like button if you haven't already. Thank you. <laughs> to date, more than 5,000 items were recovered from the Titanic wreck. Some examples include jewelry, plates, binoculars, and items of clothing. Other objects were recovered in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, along with their deceased owners. For instance, this gold-plated stopwatch was recovered 10 days after the tragedy. The watch stopped working sometime after the sinking. It belonged to Oscar Woody, whose body was recovered in the icy waters of the Titanic with his watch. He was a postmaster on the ship when it perished. His watch sold for nearly £100,000 in a recent auction. Most famously, they managed to recover this violin. Now dubbed the Miracle 110-year-old violin, it was still strapped to Wallace Hartley's body when they recovered his body in the Atlantic. Hartley was one of the musicians who continued to perform with his fellow band members as the Titanic sank. Ten years ago, the violin was sold for nearly one million pounds. Many objects recovered in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy or at the site of the wreck end up in museums. In fact, there are tons and tons and tons of Titanic museums across the world. Here are some examples. The Titanic Museum of Branson, Misery. It's literally shaped like the Titanic, so camp. The Titanic Historical Society operates a Titanic museum located in Indiana Orchid in Massachusetts. If you're in Orlando, Florida, you can visit the Titanic Experience. Pigeon Forge, Tennessee has its own Titanic Museum, also shaped like the Titanic. Unsurprisingly, given its link to the real Titanic, Southampton has a Titanic Museum. You will also find a Titanic Museum in Belfast, which also makes sense given the fact that Titanic was built there. But the obsession with Titanic does not stop here. In fact, some people are so obsessed with Titanic that they build or commission replicas of the ship. Small-scale examples include this guy turning his shed into a replica of the Titanic's dining room. I will let you decide if this is a successful replica or not. Larger-scale examples include this megalomaniac project to literally build an exact replica ship. Titanic 2, no relation to the movie Titanic 2, is a planned passenger ocean liner intended to be a functional replica of the Titanic. I really wonder, would you sell on a replica of the Titanic or would you think it's a little too much? Let me know in the comments below, I'm very curious. The project started in 2012 in Brisbane, Australia and has been delayed over and over again. Its cost is estimated at half a billion dollar. You might be surprised to know that this is not the only full-scale replica of the Titanic under construction. There is another project called the Romanda Sea Titanic, this time in China. The replica was supposed to be the focus of a tourist resort where guests could book overnight stays. It was supposed to be permanently docked in a reservoir on a river. But it is unfinished and we don't have any updates as of summer 2023. 
They used to post updates on their Twitter account, but it has been suspended for some reason. Other replicas come in the form of Legos. Titanic is a dream Lego set, 9000 pieces, 1 to 200 scale model. I mean the details on this set is incredible. The price too, eh? It's also 18 plus, like alcohol. Personally, this Lego replica is too small for my liking. Move over, losers, because the biggest Titanic Lego model has 56,000 bricks and was built by this 10-year-old. Mr. Biggison spent 700 hours building this replica. He even has a documentary on his website. Another Lego builder even managed to make a Titanic model mid-sinking. Extraordinary. Reddit users debate how this model was even built. Consumerism also loves Titanic. You can find anything Titanic. A Titanic raft like Rose and Jack fits too so that solves the debate. A Titanic remote controlled boat. There are YouTube channels entirely devoted to that type of content by the way. A Titanic backpack. A Titanic dinner plate replica. A Titanic board game. And these Titanic horses? Wait, what? These plush toys honor the 20 horses that pulled Titanic's 15 and a half ton center anchor two miles up and down hills to the train station. Sure, why not? <laughs> you get the point. At this stage of the video, we established without a doubt that the obsession with Titanic is real and alive. So it's no surprise that some people would want to explore the wreck for research purposes and maybe even bragging rights. It's time to talk about Titan because it's now part of Titanic's history. It's also the story of our obsession with the ship and whatever is left of it. For a long time, people thought the wreck of the Titanic was lost forever. But Titanic was discovered in 1985. And when the first images of the wreck were made public, people were seeing the damages for the first time. That huge passenger liner has been a dead ship, resting in an ocean grave that, until these past few days, no one had seen. Until this photograph, for 73 years, what happened when the Titanic hit bottom had been a mystery. From that moment on, researchers were able to better understand the tragedy. For example, they were able to confirm that the Titanic actually split in half. The Titanic has been submerged in water for over a century now, so it is degrading. Some people argue that research must take place now before the Titanic is too damaged. James Cameron talks about it in this documentary. Over time, decay will be inevitable, and that collapse will trap objects inside the ship that could be of some kind of historical value. See, Cameron is not just a hit movie director. He's a deep sea explorer and a fox racing enthusiast. Literally, he wears their apparel everywhere. Movie director and deep sea explorer might sound counterintuitive, but it makes total sense because you have to be very wealthy to fund this type of hobby. Cameron went down to the Titanic wreck with his own submersible. Here's Cameron talking about his sub. In my sub that I went to the, to the Challenger Deep dove safely three times deeper than, than Titanic. And it was only contemplated that myself and the engineer with whom I co-designed the vehicle would be the only pilots of that sub. And we worked on it for seven years. I would never take it upon myself to ask someone else to take that type of risk. In 2023, Titanic made headlines again when another submersible, this time from a company called OceanGate, lost contact with its launch ship above water. Whereas Cameron's submersible carried one person, himself, OceanGate's submersible was designed to carry passengers dubbed as specially trained crew members safely diving to the Titanic wreckage site. OceanGate was pretty flashy in their promotional videos. Don't miss the opportunity to be part of history. The Ocean Gate Titanic experience. There's truly nothing else like it. The CEO of Ocean Gate was Stockton Rush. He comes from a wealthy background. This helped him found the company. He believed there was a demand for deep sea exploration for a broad scope of individuals like researchers and tourists. 
In 2023, Stockton Rush and four other passengers would embark on their tragic voyage to the Titanic wreck. Design failures have been blamed for the implosion that eventually killed all five passengers. A media circus followed. And it took outsized proportions because they were on their way to Titanic. Everyone knows Titanic. It's deeply embedded in popular culture. And the irony of the context fueled the media circus too. Whereas Captain Smith did not decrease the speed of the Titanic, Stockton Rush refused to slow down his project to get his submersible certified. As a result, both leaders tragically died at the same location with passengers on board their vessels. An industry insider had raised questions about the safety of Ocean Gate's submersible. He told Rush, In your race to Titanic, you are mirroring that famous catch cry, she is unsinkable. On April 5, 2012, 100 years after the tragedy, the site of Titanic's wreck became eligible for protection under the UNESCO Convention on Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. At the time, UNESCO's Director General said, the sinking of the Titanic is anchored in the memory of humanity. From that point on, states party to the UNESCO Convention can outlaw the destruction, pillage, sale and dispersion of objects found on the site. They can take all possible measures within their power to protect the wreck and ensure that human remains there are treated with dignity. In accordance with the 2001 Convention, states also have the authority to seize any illicitly recovered artifacts and close their ports to all vessels undertaking exploration that is not done according to the principles of the treaty. Are you still watching? Can you believe we made a 72 minute long video about Titanic? Actually, this video could have been much, much, much longer. Titanic is so well documented and its impact on popular culture spreads wider than I could ever have imagined prior to making this video. If you're interested in more content about Titanic, I invite you to visit these channels. They are the true experts on this matter. As for myself, I make videos about a wide range of topics, so make sure to subscribe for more content like this. If you like this video, just like the video, it helps a lot. Thank you in advance. I also want to thank our returning sponsor, Next Chance. All the details are in the description below, and I cannot wait to see you for another video like this. Bye!